Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, and um, good morning to those uh, in the US West Coast. Good evening to those of, uh, in South Asia. Um, uh, thank you for joining us here at Berkeley. Um, I'm Alan D'Souza. I'm chair of the Department of Art Practice. And I'm here standing in for my colleague, actually, Professor Asma Kazmi, who I hope is in the audience, but who is traveling. Uh, and her inter internet might not be sufficiently reliable to conduct the conversation, so I'm standing in for her instead. Um, so thanks, Asma. And uh, I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors for making this talk possible. The Institute for South Asia Studies, the Sarah Kailath Chair of India Studies, South Asia Art Initiative, the Department of Art, uh, Department of History of Art, and the Department of Art Practice. I'm very pleased to introduce Mariam Ina Hasnain, this year's winner of the annual UC Berkeley South Asia Artist Prize, which is awarded for an outstanding body of work by an artist of the South Asian diaspora, or by those whose work addresses the politics and cultures of South Asia. Hasnain was born and raised in Karachi, Pakistan, and that's also where she now lives. She studied fine art first in Kuala Lumpur and then in London. She holds a BA in fine art from Goldsmiths, University of London, and an MA in fine art from Chelsea College, University of the Arts in London. Hasnain's practice is underpinned by an interest in trade, empire, migration, borders, and citizenship. These themes are explored through a variety of mediums, primarily painting, sound, installation, and textile interventions. Her studio practice extends into the realms of research, curation, and collaborative practice. She is an active founding member of two artist collectives, Neulinga and Forum Collective, and has previously exhibited with Arclex Weekend, London Grads Now at the Saatchi Gallery, and the South Asia Institute, Chicago. Hasnain most recently co-curated a project for Later Tate, Britain, uh, times Chelsea College, titled Constructing Landscapes, Building Worlds, where she also participated as an artist. Her work was recently acquired for University Yards London's permanent collection, and most recently, she's been awarded the first UC Berkeley South Asia Artist Prize. So welcome, Mariam. And uh, uh, let me turn over to you and a quick reminder to the audience that uh, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. So please join me welcoming Mariam. Thank you, Alan, for that introduction. Um, I'd also like to use this opportunity to thank Benita and Asma and the Institute of South Asia Studies that has in the past and continues to support conversations with some of my favorite scholars, thinkers, and creatives. So I'm just going to turn my Having just moved back to Karachi after studying in London for the past four years, it feels fitting to open with my first public facing exhibition that took place in Karachi five years ago. The exhibition was titled Isaya Ke Parcham Tali, which directly translates to under the shadow, uh, translates to the shadow over our flag. It was curated by Abdullah Qureshi and Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. The multi-site exhibition um, tries to use the city as a gallery. I also, in this draw on uh, the research of a, a publishing collective that's based in Karachi called Exhausted Geographies that seeks to um, speak of the spatial and social fractures within the city's history.
the Rambag, um, the original Rambag site, which is now known as Arambag, was the site for brutal, um, post, a brutal post-partition massacre of Hindus and Sikhs. The site is derelict for the most part, with the exception of these styles from the colonial era. For this piece, I create, I recreate the tiles and place them in the courtyard of what was once the, the Theosophical Society of Karachi, but now functions as a school. And a lot of my current practice looks at textiles and deals with their materiality. My introduction to this medium grows out of conversations with my aunt that lost her eyesight. It helps me realize the limited encounters that my work creates. And I set out to create something more interactive and tactile. Using a color detection software that she uses on her smartphone, um, pixels around her are selected by her camera and then color names are announced to go with them. The color names are incredibly arbitrary and draw on analogies to draw analogies to food and geography. A traditional um, tufted textile has one side that is latex, but in this case, I chose to leave it exposed. So you have two very different um, surfaces to interact with. This side is tight knots, which are almost braille-like, and while this side is has a ver has varying file lengths and is a lot more dense. In 2018, this was shown with the Neulinga Collective's first show at the Crypt Gallery in London, which is an atmospheric grade one listed building, which means that minimal um, installation alterations can be made. And so in this, in this context, we suspended the piece to allow um, audience members to engage with both sides of the surface. And then later in 2020, it was shown in at the Saatchi Gallery as part of London Grads Now, where the gallery didn't allow for any uh, tactile interactions with the piece due to COVID safety regulations. It did, however, have a very different overall impact as it sat in a stark bite cube where the bulk of the art sits closer to the walls. I'm just going to play a short sound bite of what the soundscape sounds like. Black, very dark brown, dark gray, purplish brown, dark sand, dark gray blue, putty, white, light eggplant, white, gunmetal, light eggplant, white, beige, pale brown, mushroom, dark gray, white, and then the long rupture is uh, a lot of my current practice deals more heavily with textiles and particular existing materials. The long rupture is a piece I made during the Balakot clash when tensions between Pakistan and India escalate. The Radcliffe line is a visual cartographic element often employed by artists on both sides of the border. It seems like an almost ubiqu ubiquitous image on the South Asian imagination. The, the map is drawn out in turmeric based. Um, and really, um, there's, a, there's quite a rich history of using maps as visual um, elements within the South Asian context. An exhibition in 2009 at Cornell University that was curated by Hamad Nasser and Iftikhar Dadi was called Lines of control partition as a productive space, um, sees artists like Nalini Milani and Shipta Gupta, and of course, Zarina Hashmi employ similar visuals. And though this piece can be considered to be more contentious, the Pakistani and Indian flags that are twined together are manufactured and bought through Amazon. They are made in Fuzhou, China by the same producer. The flight bots that you're seeing at the bottom of the piece are reference what the airspace on that day looked like as flights were, as the airspace was cleared and flights were direct, diverted. I often think about trade routes and flight paths and the idea of mobility that has always been easier for objects than individuals. 
And in the similar vein of viewing textiles from an aerial perspective and maps for suggesting a sense of location that has removal and distance and ultimately our cultural signifiers, is this space um, swept under the rug, which uses materials sourced from three different localities. This is a detail of the intervention done on the material. And this is um, an installation view. The maps, the map, the scroll um, like lines that suggest maps in this case are painted with turmeric, saffron, indigo, and pomegranate on burlap. And this is another installation view to give you a sense of scale. This is from a personal archive of images that I hold of, of textiles that I find interesting. Originally called Axi or picture rugs, now more often known as war rugs, during the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, weavers would use their narrative-based craft to chart occupations and turmoil. More recently made war rugs are highly geometricized and use very recognizable representation. I was told that a bulk of these war rugs were bought by people abroad, allowing consumers to realign themselves politically through their most recent home furnishing. The same slippage of authenticity that's so deeply entangled with capitalism is something I see in other objects sold under vague descriptors like exotic or ethnic. The same visual language exists in the rug um, in this rug that you're seeing in the images that was that were bought from ASOS, which is a fashion e-commerce company. The symbols on the rug feel familiar and allude to the same sense of motion control and of course, play. Economy of Movement 2 is a more recent mixed media work that results in a short film. It was initially shown at Tate Britain Late. Um, online under a project titled Constructing Landscape Building Worlds and is currently a part of South, the South Asia Institute in Chicago's online exhibition titled Diasporic Rhizome. So just to give you a background into the making of how that video comes to be, um, my use of turmeric is a nod to the East India Company's extraction of the subcontinent. It also references a sense of othering as well as erasure. Anyone that has previously cooked with turmeric knows that it is a very resilient pigment. Images created by that dyeing and staining process are then projected onto this site where they create the illusion of a portal through a fleeting projected image. The same image when animated becomes a palimpsestic char character chart, a palimpsest charting movements of migration and trade. When projected onto a Georgian building in London, it becomes the ultimate orientalist trope, the magic carpet. The films exist digitally, but rely heavily on physical materials. The film. And this is a still from that same phone. Propositional object plays with those same cycles of production, image to object and vice versa. The lenticular image is formed using a combination of two scans, 
at the front and the back of the carpet, making it seem as though a static object plays host to moving patterns. That same object is manipulated to seem less tactile and more glitch infested, which is how I end up with these two prints, which are initially large scale backlit carpets made to look like they were unfurling. I again address this issue of the glitch, but this time manually through painting on the same surface, borrowing from the aesthetic of a video game disruption. My last piece is a part of an is part of an ongoing interview film which revisits the artist statement as a subversive construction of reality through the lens of criticality but also humor. I think it's also worth mentioning that the voiceover is unscripted and I'm grateful to friends who obliged me in my experiments. At the heart of Mariam's practice is the act of storytelling, giving voice to experiences and objects rarely encountered in a gallery. Building on an upbringing in Karachi and time spent studying in Kuala Lumpur and London, Mariam's work frequently explores the act of translation and the meanings that are gained and lost between contexts. In one body of work, Mariam takes as a starting point the carpet an object with the many most roles. recent body of work is concerned carpets with duality found in houses parents. as luxury objects, carpets, photographs, but also as practical printed installation. In holographic paper. Carpets are also as religious objects, around the world, protecting the, the needs of those who pray. Sitting awkwardly Latterly, into existence. it became objects for export and both plunder. can be understood individually. For the weaver, it's, it's impossible a carpet is time itself, understand both. the time taken to produce an intricate pattern is too great to be merely the process of production. Mariam is therefore asking the viewer to look for these hidden narratives, those lost in translation. Uh, thank you, Mariam. <laughs> That's so rich and um, it's it's so interesting to end with that uh, that video. Um, you know that raises so many questions about um, you know the artist's voice, who's speaking for the artist, and of course then the artist presenting that themselves um, as their own work, and as again back into the artist's voice. Um, so I. I have a number of sort of overlapping thoughts in my head. I'm trying to sort of connect them. Um, but but let, let me start with, um, I think when the jury and, and um, uh, you know, I have to also say that I was part of the jury that was looking at your work. Um, and what was so interesting for us was that you were using uh, what were fairly familiar uh, materials, you know, like carpet and, mm -hmm. carpets and spices, um, which are, you know, become associated with the work of contemporary South Asian artists. Um, and then also tropes of, you know, color and pattern, um, uh, you know, um, uh, textiles and, and texture as well, um, which have also been associated with South Asian artists. But you also bringing other elements and other media to them, uh, you know, digital media, the lenticular print. So actually you're, you're disrupting any easy association with, um, you know, those materials uh, um, or even how we should, you know, think about them or experience them. Um, and I wonder if you can just talk a little bit more about that intentional disruption of those tropes. Um. Yeah, sure. I've also, it's worth mentioning that um, the artist statement really emerges from an experimental place, but it's also an artist statement that I've been using um, to apply for open calls and exhibitions and fellowships. It's also the one that I sent to you guys as part of, as, as a piece, but also as the artist statement. So I, 
I think about that a lot. I think about the tropes um, that artists are are made to fall into, and often this happens in language. I think that we easily um, start using a really specific art school or art institution vernacular. Um, I have to stop myself from saying words like liminal, but then so aware of how the artist is centered in their practice. And I think a little bit of that was trying to take agency of these materials um, and, and thinking about the different ways and worlds that they might exist in. Uh, but also from a historic standpoint, if you look at the production of textiles, the computer screen, the way that it works today um, is heavily influenced how in the way that jacquard looms worked. Mm -hmm. And so that that idea that something quite distant um, might be rooted in something completely different from elsewhere is, is something that I like to jump between. Right. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, so that that jumping and and of course you know your your multiple locations that you know um, originally uh, you know Karachi then Kuala Lumpur London and back to Karachi um, there does seem to be um, you know the multiple locations uh, the use of multiple media um, as well as multiple voices so the, the, there's different speaking voices. Um, uh, and so maybe talk a little bit more about, um, again, a very deliberate use of multiplicity, uh, you know, uh, across the range, you know, as material, as voice. I think um, also, I guess, in this sense, it's a, it's a literal um, difference in the vo voice that's employed from my own. Um, and that might be how artists think of the way that they might be perceived, either from um, institutions or or within a larger canon of con contemporary art and where they might position themselves because sometimes you have control over these things but very often you're um, othered and kind of just relegated to boxes that you didn't uh, necessarily choose to be in right yeah and so I think that might be where that idea stems from um, Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and you know, in, in the work itself, I, I was struck by your titles that you know you're very precise about um, the the source materials uh, and you know where you acquire them from, and also their um, uh, their their own material histories and and manufacturing histories. Um, so you also don't allow the materials the, themselves to operate in a singular manner. Um, and, you know, I, I, I was struck by the following material, that you track material culture, but you do it through, um, you know, political division um, across, across uh, geographical borders. Um, and, uh, yeah, I wonder if you can talk more about that aspect of your work, you know, which is the research base. Um, which we encounter through type, the titles, you know, most, most immediately. Um, but yeah, just a little more about the, the, the research aspect of your practice. I think again, that's heavily rooted in this idea of me wanting to bring um, agency back to these objects, because I think textiles are so burdened by associations um, to, you know, orientalist tropes, but also to gender and, Initially, when I started working with textiles, there was this assumption by people around me that, of course, you're a South Asian woman, this would be um, your medium of choice. And in that moment, I tried, I tried to make um, a decision that every time I would use material that came from elsewhere, I wouldn't strip that object of that history. And in some cases, I think those histories are really important. They can be slightly playful, which is in the case of that ASOS, um, rug and it it really like i guess does locate them in multiple um geograph uh, geographic context but also in, in multiple modes of making that sometimes are, are really out of my control and i might just stumble upon 
Right. Um, Interesting that you know you use the word elsewhere because, of course, if you're you know if you're tracking, um, you know, uh, the the material production of globalization, um, you know, uh, in a, in a sense there is no elsewhere because you know the uh, the global flow of of you know of material goods. Um, is, is one of the things that actually connects us um, uh, in ways that, you know, uh, can also be sort of dominating forms of connection. <laughs> uh, and in that sense, we're, ne we're never, um, uh, there, there is no real elsewhere. Uh, and, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I think one of the things that the jury was also celebrating about your work is you're actually bringing attention to that, those questions. Um, of what we might initially think of as uh, being about somewhere else. Um, you know, uh, I, I love, for example, that, um, you know, you mentioned where you, you, you bought the carpet, for example, in Lewisham, uh, you know, in, in, in a particular store. And so it connects the sort of geo different geographies. Um, so actually that there is no elsewhere. Um, but um, how, Actually, follow, following that notion of an, a different place, a supposedly a different mm -hmm. place, um, uh, yeah, can you say a little more about actually working in different locations now, you know, uh, between, between London and, and, and now Karachi? I think, um, yeah, that feels especially uh, important given that I've just, this relocation is very recent. I think that when I was in London, my work became very um, aware of the way that it might be positioned as other, but also my own um, upbringing in Karachi and and really what what is it like to be raised in this post-colonial context where you're constantly speaking in a language that might not be your own and um, what kind of friction does that create? whereby you suddenly like arrive in this whole new context, people expect you to make a certain kind of work. And then sometimes you do end up making it. Um, and then that's when I use the, the titles to kind of subvert that. In, in London, it was really interesting because I think that was a, that was a sense of, um, of removal and celebration simultaneously in terms of the colonial legacy. It's also home to some of the best, uh, ironically, some of the best South Asian archives. So there was a wealth of information there. I got to um, study and work with a lot of other artists, curators, and historians um, who have sort of deep uh, connections to the global South. And uh, and now to be back in Karachi is is interesting because I'm it's I'm now trying to look at my practice and think about it um, differently and think about it more in terms of the materials that I'm using or, or with a greater sensitivity to the materials that I'm using and where they've come from, which I've always tried to do when I would take things back to London. But I think now that I have this chance to actually foster connections and have um, longer, more sustained conversations with craft makers and how those narratives come into those objects. So I think that's possibly where it might be shifting. Okay, great. Well, let, let, let me turn to um, see what questions we have. Um, we have one from Uttra Rajkopal. Um, hello, Mariam, and congratulations. Uh, please can I ask, what are the determining factors when displaying your textile works? For example, whether it is on the ground without the plinth on the wall or suspending them. Hi, Uthra, so glad that um, you could listen in today. I think that uh, often textiles come with their own connotations and so to have them in a, in a white, white um, cube space can be disruptive, but then also to position them as art objects is, is an interesting, um, strategy because it seems like a very different world from the world that those materials emerge from. And yet they're all within this larger entangled sphere. Uh, 
I think with the more interactive uh, uh, dufted pieces, I really like for the for both surfaces to be exposed and and to allow for that kind of uh, engagement when uh, when it's when it's a larger scale work. I, I like like the idea of it being both on the wall and on the floor to have this quite literal slippage of um, you know an object entering two different planes and um, yeah okay uh, yeah it was interesting actually then uh, also, also uh, I, th I think you, you said um, you know some of the stipulations were because of COVID restrictions mm -hmm. Uh, so having to negotiate that as well, and then how the viewer behaves. Yeah, so that I think in that case the work changes quite a bit because um, when it was at the Sachi Gallery, the option of having a sound piece to go with it was not there because if it was on speakers, it would create a sound bleed for the other work in the gallery, and headphones aren't exactly um, SOP friendly, and also touching the same uh, surface in a public space is. Also not so it was this was it really uh, as much as I tried to bring it in to this physical tangible space it shifts back into a very visual um, mode of being exhibited. Hmm. Um, actually, just in terms of the, uh, the 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 work itself, since since we're seeing it on screen at the moment, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, could, can you? Tell us a little bit more about actually the physical experience of seeing the lenticular prints um, for people that might not actually know what that means. Of course, yes. So a lenticular print um, comes from sort of an 80s um, print technology where it's an acrylic sheet that's scored and you have two different images on it. And every time you move, it looks like the image is in flux. So it's very, it's very glitchy. Um, you'll often see it used for ad materials or in birthday cards or you know games that involve card swapping for for children or that sort of thing. So it was, um, and then again, that's something about the making and then the exposed side of the fabric that's really interesting for me. So I, I wanted to have the side with the knots and then the side with the file and have them in one image. But every time you shift it it would look like an entirely new object. Mm, okay, great. So um, let's see, we have a question from Asma, Kazmi. Uh, hi, Maria, I'm, I'm wondering how you think your work might change now that you're back in Karachi. I, um, I think it, it means that suddenly I have uh, access do so many different modes of textile making, which is something that I'm interested in. And uh, also another thing that I mentioned earlier was to have this chance to speak um, face to face with crafters and to be able to maybe in some way archive their narratives of making. Um, yeah, actually, there's 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 a question there's a question also that's that's connected to that from Alina. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, what kinds of materials are you looking forward to using now that you've re relocated to Karachi? Um, so I have also somewhat become, I've over the past four, since I started working with textiles, I've, I've been collecting them. And every time I, I find something interesting that I could potentially at some point do an intervention on, I, um, I try and get my hands on it. So at this point, um, I have a backlog of materials that I haven't been able to access for a chunk of last year. So turning to them at some point uh, is something that I'm doing. Um, but also just uh, thinking through it in different modes and potentially digital. So again, pursuing um, the film trajectory of it as well and more projected installations and how a textile might mediate that. Um, so let's see, Thariel Masood has a question. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. We were wondering here, um, I'm not sure where here is, but um, how do you place your own work within the framework of the trade routes that you engage with? I 
think that, that that's a really good question. Um, I'm so glad you could be here, Feriel. And I think that they, it almost feels impossible to remove them from that history. So every time I'm using um, particular spices as pigments or cotton or silk or any kind of textile, I'm hyper aware of, of the history and that kind of removal from one part of the world to be sold to another part of the world. And there's no, um, I feel like it's almost impossible or something that wouldn't sit right with me to remove it from that context. But so I, I really do try and locate it within um, the trade routes and the histories that those objects and materials belong to. Um, any any sort of um, you know consequence of that? Because we all, you know we can think of art, artworks as as trade goods as mm -hmm. well that also yeah. circulate. In, in in different discursive ways, but you know also as material culture, um, and so any thoughts to um, uh, what agency you exert over you know the circulation of your work, uh, and I'm thinking again of the, the multiple voices that represent you. Um, yeah, I think that that might be a sort of. A conflict in the sense because for in the case of those sound pieces or the ones with the where I'm using voices they're never my own and so there is a sense of relinquishing um, control but the decision to employ those was my own in a way um, but I, th I think with uh, art objects or objects generally that are put into exhibition context it's really interesting um, when you think about museums and objects that come from elsewhere that are now in entirely new locations. I think it's really important to uh, have conversations about decolonizing institutions or what that looks like outside of putting um, writing next to objects. What, what are the other ways in which we can allow objects to have um, connections to history and agency outside of removal or forced removal. Mm. And we have a question in relation to that from Biz Iqbal, who's actually one of the, uh, who's a Berkeley MFA student. Okay. Uh, uh, can you speak more about what it means for these works to be placed in, in Western institutions, economies, and especially in a post-colonial context? I think that's a I think that's a really good question and again something that I'm I'm constantly grappling with because if it's not um, if it's not the physical material then it might be a narrative that I've imposed on that material so for instance to speak about um, conflict within South Asia and then to position that work physically in Britain um, how how do you remove well, you can't remove it from um, the legacy of empire. So maybe it needs to be speaking to that. And um, yeah, I don't, I, I wish I had a straightforward answer, but I would love to have a longer conversation with you uh, about this. I'm sure Panita can, can um, uh, we, tell us exchange details. Uh, we can connect you, especially because I, you know, I, I think that I, I know business work and I think there are interesting overlaps. Um, okay. Too. Um, and uh, actually, we have an, another Berkeley grad student, um, Hala Kadura, who's asking, um, well, uh, truly inspired. Uh, um, what's the process of creating your work? But um, do you often go back? home to create your work? And what does it mean uh, for you to create work in different geographies? Um, and so here, I think, you know, to complicate this notion of home as well, like what does it now mean to be at home? Um, uh, thinking about an, this other location, this elsewhere, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, London. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, um, I think sometimes also there can be sort of, very practical limitations to a certain um, piece. So in, in the context of the long rupture, to use those flags as symbols in a piece was something that I could do in London because that was potentially less at stake, but, but to show that um, 
least in Karachi or in South Asia, would be a lot more contentious to move. Um, so those are, you know, things that I'm aware of, I, I suppose. Um, but also in terms of creating in different um, geographies, I think sometimes my uh, response to materials is, is a, is a lot longer term. So I'll, I'll have a material and I'll sit with it and I'll think about the history and do, um, you know, research into it. And so it, it might be that I'm uh, in, a, in a practical sense, sort of like in between locations working on it or that I've never fully stopped working on it. Well, let, let's go to uh, a little more to some to materiality itself. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not going to read this whole question, but um, you know there is about you mentioned that due to COVID, the gallery, uh, this is Sachi Gallery, limited how mm -hmm. uh, viewers could interact with the work, reframing the tactile experience of the work. I'm wondering if this experience impacted how you think about and approach tactility. I. I think it really did change the work um, and initially what I was viewing as a setback for the work um, helped me think about the ways that I might um, approach materials or concepts or try and negotiate those two because when I when I started doing the first textile uh, the first after textile there was this this idea of really speaking or being able to find the solution for it to bridge that um, experience for somebody engaging with it. And that opened a whole host of new questions. Uh, and I think that in that I, I do like to think um, about textiles and the different realms that objects could exist in, but also what I haven't included in my presentation was that at the Saatchi show, I also had a film reel. Um, which was which was different to the textile piece there but it really did grow out of a textile as well and it was very much about fanning a surface and this sort of removed um, sterile almost drone like footage of a surface so that was um, that may have not bridged uh, my concerns in terms of access to the object but that was a sort of different angle to it. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a question from um, uh, Shirin Ahmad, and, um, uh, which asks, can you talk about your digital work and your other works are so physical um, in, in how we've been talking about tactility and materiality. And so um, mm -hmm. can you talk about the, the digital a little more um, and, and maybe in relation to tactility and materiality? Yeah, of course. Um, I think that really is a, I was thinking about how, um, thinking about the history of textiles and also maybe thinking about the future of textiles or, or the idea of an image and an object as, um, as isolated entities. Because with the digital work, what I'm trying to do is, is find different iterations of that same textile, but in a physical non-space. So it might exist in, as a projection or, um, on a screen, uh, so it's for for me. I think that's the result of finding um, what war rugs used to look like and where they're going now, and finding these parallels between video games and contemporary war rugs, which um, seems <laughs> seems like a strange notion, but once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so I think it it might be about trying to push that idea of um, inter interactivity with an object into something that is digital. Hmm. Okay, so this question from um, um, Harris Sheikh, who, who's seen the work in, at Saatchi, um, and uh, it says, there seems to be a strong narrative in your work, a social commentary of sorts. Um, can you talk about the process? Is it a deliberate narrative you start with, or, or does the process inform the so the process very much does um, inform the art and rarely will it go according to the initial intention set out because whereas the, in the case of that uh, dufted textile piece that you would have seen at the Saatchi it started out as me wanting it to be something 
quite interactive and quite playful and having that sound element to go with it. But what really ends up emerging from it is um, me wanting to critique language and the way that it's employed in quite a divisive, sometimes arbitrary, really analogy heavy way. Um, which I guess that same vein runs through in the um, video interview work. Mm. So it's the, I think I start with one uh, or multiple agendas and it really just sort of spirals from there. And... Uh -huh. Okay, uh, yeah. well, we have um, uh, a question from Ariba Kazi who says, congratulations. Um, uh, listening to you and learning more about your art. Uh, what's been your favorite medium um, and uh, so far and why? And uh, what other mediums do you wish to explore? Um, hi, Ariba. I think that I, ha I have still um, developed a sort of familiarity and warmth to textiles whereby I've really enjoyed working with them. Um, so maybe in a way they're my favorite, but I like, again, thinking of them as, um, as something that, that could roll into something completely different. So sound or, or film or site specific uh, projection installations. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know that I have a, a one word answer <laughs> for a favorite, a, a favorite. But I, I guess, you know, also what, what sort of opportunities different media give you um, and, and I guess, I mean, uh, also in combination, since, you know, you combine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that seems to be, you know, consistent in your work is, is actually the, the combination of, of different techniques and different media. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's see. Uh, um, okay, here's a very different question. Um, uh, from Hussain uh, Shah, uh, what part of being a Pakistani woman is most important for you to convey in your work? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, um, I, you know, I, I think that um, even if I was not to center myself as a Pakistani woman within my work, it would be done for me. Uh, so maybe maybe it's a maybe it's a sense um, it's a sense of agency or the ability to have some sense of uh, some sense of self or criticality or or even have a um, you know this was really interesting but Niza said this in her talk but to have a walking practice to to be able to use one's body physically to map you know to physically map a space is. It's a really interesting one as a Pakistani woman, uh, because then you start thinking about public space and private space and visibility, and those bring about um, many conversations, but also concerns. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you, you've spoken to that already a little bit, you know, by, um, earlier saying that, um, uh, you know, despite yourself, you're going to be placed by, by viewers, by curators, and so on, in, in different ways, and so you're already being located, um, and uh, you know, and, and interesting to see how your work negotiates that placement, but also, um, you know, through your other work of um, within the collective artist collectives, curating, and so on, that you're actually trying to address those um, in in really direct ways. Um, so you're actually taking control over how you you place yourself as well. To the to the extent that I'm allowed to, I guess. Well, yeah, always there's always that allowance, but I but I think um, sometimes also uh, uh, as artists we we often don't give ourselves permission to do that. Let's see. Uh, uh, Anna, um, uh, if Anna has a question, let's see. Um, your experience living, moving to different countries has clearly influenced your work and style to date. How do you plan or not to continue incorporating that global dimension in your work moving forward? 
I think, um, hi, Anna, that's a really good question and also something that I've been thinking about because I think uh, in terms of colonial legacies or, or, or larger histories of the global south, it's, um, it's really impossible at this point for me to isolate myself from longer or larger conversations um, about institutions or about public visibility. So I think uh, that is always going to be a concern that underpins my practices is um, our institutions being, what kind of selection processes are they going in terms of representing artists? Um, whether the conversations that are being had are these uh, market motivated or are they criticality motivated? Uh, I guess just maybe shifting them to the context of me now living and working in Karachi, but still thinking about the global South and um, its relationship to colonialism. Uh, we have another question from uh, Biz again. Um, many conversations in the art making space seem to overlap in Western pedagogy uh, for diaspora. These conversations almost never speak to the problems within these spaces, like um, Pakistan, Afghanistan. It seems like the work is always looking out in sort of the other way. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, I think this is a, this is a, I think Biz and I are going to have to be introduced <laughs> and have this much longer chat. Um, but, but in terms of art, academia, or um, visual culture scholarship, I think that's, that's a really uh, rich area to look into to find um, the parallels or the disconnects between people living in those contexts or diasporic experiences. So I know that I often look at the third text um, as a source and they, they'll often um, be doing that jump between different contexts. So it, is, it won't just be about South Asian artists practicing in um, practicing and exhibiting in the UK, it will also look to the other contexts that they emerge from and are still practicing in. Mm. Um, and to, you know, to expand on that, um, you know, having trained, uh, you know, most recently at Goldsmiths and Chelsea. Um, and so, you know, if you any, any more thoughts around the kind of the, the pedagogy and the training um, that you've gone through, and this is, you know, in relation to business question, who's also a student in a Western institution. Yeah, so um, that's a, I think it's, it's a really important conversation to be had, but it's a work in progress. It's incredibly um, slow. I'm not sure why that is, but maybe it's also just not the kind of thing that you can be really, um, that you can't really have knee jerk reactions to. But I know that there are institutions that are now rethinking what they're faculty might look and sound like, or what the resources that they make available um, to their students are. I think this is, this kind of programming is really important to allow artists or thinkers like you and me um, to be having that conversation. Um, I know that Chelsea has a uh, train, which is, which again has conversations in that vein, um, Goldsmiths was, you know, was, uh, Gara, which was an anti-racist movement, was uh, did a lot of work at Goldsmiths as well. So to be around that was really interesting, and to be, a, in some peripheral sense, a uh, part of those conversations was obviously incredibly important. But there's still so much to be done. Just in just in the way that you might um, be having a casual conversation with somebody and in your studio on your course and the first um, five references that they come up with will always be you know a really a really like eurocentric north american um artist context whereas there are you know that that could be like the first small step could be you having conversations with your peers and and making them look at other practices 
Uh, yeah, and, you know, of course, we, um, you know, we, we can't forget that we're actually speaking from within the South Asia, uh, you know, Institute of South Asia Studies um, uh, <laughs> uh, in Berkeley. So, you know, just re reminded of uh, Trinity Minhwa's sort of coinage of, um, you know, the first world and the third, and the third world and the first. Um, that, you know, those relations are complicated um, and, you know, and here I'm, I'm also speaking as, as the South Asian chair of an art department, um, you know. Um, so um, let's see, I think, uh, Mohammed Tahir just, um, it's not really a question, but, you know, he just mentions uh, how India and Pakistan join hand in hand in, in culture of South Asia. Um, and of course, that complicated, um, and yeah. you know, often antagonistic um, uh, relationship, um, you know, within South Asia itself. Um, uh, um, but I don't know if you any any thoughts, um, uh, you know, about that between India and Pakistan, um, and and I guess the the nomenclature, of, you know, South Asia. Yeah, no, of course, it's, uh, I would like to not just think of it as India, Pakistan, but sort of greater um, South Asia, where these relationships are some, sometimes quite dense and, and really shouldn't be. But uh, I think more cross-border collaborations, whatever that might look like. So I imagine there's a lot of red tape to overcome to actually, um, for those things to materialize. I think that, that that some sort of exchange and collaboration is ideal. Okay, um, but uh, yeah, and you know, when we're not here to uh, to solve the di diplomatic questions of our day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, but but thank you so much, uh, Marianne. This has been actually so illuminating and. Um, uh, and and a and a pleasure, and I think to to um, be able to enjoy the work, um, and to have a little time with it, um, and also to be able to think about all the different questions that you know the um, your work raises in, in really complicated mm. ways, you know, which which I think is really you know bodes well for the future of um, South Asian art. Um, so thank you everyone um, for, for joining us and um, we're, we're getting sort of uh, thanks and claps and, um, in, in uh, the Q&A. Uh, so thank you once again for joining all of us and um, thank you, Marianne. Thank you.